Okay, hello, I'm JJ Joaquin, and welcome to Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. So this is a special episode for us because we're live on Facebook and on YouTube. Our topic for this episode is philosophy as lifelong learning. According to the American philosopher John Dewey, education is not preparation for life, education is life itself. Now, this perhaps echoes Aristotle's idea that a well-educated person is someone who has practical wisdom, someone who, from a wealth of life experiences, is able to discern the right sort of things from the wrong ones. Now, in short, education is lifelong learning. It is a continuous, ongoing process. Now, the idea of lifelong learning has now caught on in different educational institutions in the world. In particular, this has been explored in Southeast Asia, U.S., the U.K., and here in the Philippines as well. But what is this idea all about? And how does philosophy figure in this picture? And why does viewing philosophy as lifelong learning matter? Now, to discuss these questions with us, we are joined by Professor Marian Tabit, Director of Studies in Philosophy at the University of Oxford's Department for Continuing Education. Hello, Professor Talbot. Welcome to Philosophy and What Matters. Hi there. Hi, everyone. Okay, so before we start our main topic, let's first discuss your philosophical background. What led you to study philosophy? Uh, well, it was actually quite interesting because, of course, like most people in the UK, I hadn't studied philosophy at school. And in fact, I hated school. Um, <laughs> I was thrown out of school when I was 15. Uh, for truancy and disruption for those who care about that sort of thing um, and I spent the next five years traveling around I never got to the Philippines sadly um, but I did get to Southeast Asia which which was just beautiful mm -hmm. um, and then when I got back to England I was 23 uh, and I felt strongly the need for some intellectual stimulation um, so I started a course with the Open University and because I had no qualifications whatsoever I had to do a foundation course and I did the arts one during which was philosophy mm -hmm. um, and as I started doing it and in those days it was formal logic um, I sat up all night it was the most difficult thing I had ever experienced uh, and I realized in the morning that it was also the most enjoyable night I think I'd ever experienced mm -hmm. and so I started reading more I went full-time um, at London University where I achieved a first and came on to Oxford where I've been ever since okay, so, so philosophy found me rather than I found philosophy yeah, so I, I, I read your biography, and, and one of the pictures there of you is that you are uh, a lost teenager. You're a rebel. Is that, is that the case? Um, well, I don't think I would have been thrown out of school if, if I wasn't to some extent a rebel, yes. Uh, <laughs> so you were uh, I, I mean, I hated school, absolutely hated it, and, and I did everything I could to avoid it, and so... I, I did play truant a lot. <laughs> okay, so who are your key influences in studying philosophy? Um, I, I think mostly it's one person. Um, I discovered Donald Davidson quite early in my career. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he was the philosopher to study when I was an undergraduate, so it's not surprising perhaps. Um, but he has continued to influence me in a way that he um, perhaps stopped influencing other people. I think he's right about a lot of things that other people don't think he's right about. Mm -hmm. So what particular philosophy, philosophical idea of Davidson do you hold? Well, he argues um, for what he calls anomalous monism, mm -hmm. um, which is the idea that... Um, uh, mental states are physical states, but they're not identical as types, but only as tokens. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he argues that this solves the problem of mental, physical, psychophysical causation. Um, the reason people don't like that argument is because, at least partly, of an argument by Yagwon Kim, 
uh -huh. um, who um, put forward the causal exclusion argument, uh, according to which um, the fact that the mental state is identical to a physical state means that the physical state screens the mental state from being the cause cause of an action. Mm. Um, but I think Kim hasn't understood Davidson's theory of causation. Um, and once you do understand Davidson's theory of causation, you no longer find the causal uh, exclusion argument compelling. Okay, so aside from Davidson, who else influenced your thinking in philosophy? Well, Davidson is the most important person. I, I mean, apart from that, it's the usual suspects. So in Descartes, I, I rate very highly. Mm -hmm. um, Plato and Aristotle, I rate very highly. Um, but quite honestly, in the 35 years that I've been studying philosophy, different people have come to the fore. And it's quite often been because I've been lecturing on this person or that person uh, and have had to study their work very carefully for my lectures, which has led to a deeper appreciation of that person than I had before. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go to our main topic now. So the idea of continuing education or philosophy as lifelong learning. So you're from the Department of Continuing Education at Oxford. So can you tell us something about the nature of the department? Um, yes, well, uh, OUDC, as we call it, um, is, is the largest department in Oxford. We have something like 14,000 um, students. And that's because we have uh, in the department nearly every discipline, not quite every discipline, because we have lo no laboratories. So um, we can do science only to the extent that we collaborate with the rest of the university. Mm -hmm. um, but it means that anyone off the street, or indeed in these days of the internet, anyone in the world can come and study at Oxford. Mm -hmm. um, by doing one of our weekend courses or our online courses or, or our, um, if they can get to Oxford and you'd be amazed at the distances people are prepared to come for a weekend course, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, th there's a history in the continuing education program, right? So I think I read somewhere that it started in the 19th century. Uh, yes, that's that's right. I mean, we've actually just had our, I think it's our 140th anniversary. Wow. Um, when we, um, I mean, we started as Oxford Extension College. So if you've heard of um, Vera Britton, for example, mm -hmm. um, who wrote Testament of Youth, um, she lost her fiancé and both her brothers, I think, in the First World War. Mm -hmm. um, she... Uh, managed to study at Oxford by getting in through the continuing education department or the Oxford extension department and many other people have studied here it was particularly useful of course for women um, in in the 19th century because of course women weren't admitted to any of the main universities at that point or if they were admitted it was it was under very different conditions from men mm -hmm. So what's the main vision and mission of this program, this department? Uh, it's in, the main mission is increasing participation. And mm -hmm. the idea is that there are people who've missed out on education for all sorts of reasons. For example, those of us who were expelled for truancy um, <laughs> missed out on a university education the first time round mm -hmm. and needed some means of having a second chance. Now, I got my second chance through the Open University, um, which, of course, is another um, strand of lifelong learning. But, but the continuing uh, education department of Oxford University is like the Open University in that many of the courses are open access. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, having put your toe in the educational water, and maybe taking it further with doing something like um, the Certificate of Higher Education or, um, or one of our diplomas, um, you get confident with, with your ability to engage in higher education. And many people have gone on from our short courses to study degrees or, or further degrees or, or even doctorates. Mm -hmm. 
But how, do we, how should we understand the idea of lifelong learning? Well, I think it does what it says on the tin. <laughs> it, it, education ought to be lifelong. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, I finished my last degree 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I've got more degrees than I've got O-levels. I love to say that. Okay. Um, but I finished my last one 30 years ago. If that had marked the end of my education, that would be very sad, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I've spent my life learning. Mm -hmm. And philosophy has, has largely, I mean, uh, philosophy has been the content of what I've learned during those 40 years or whatever. Um, but it's also guided my learning in other directions. Um, I, I, I think that when you stop learning, you stop living. Okay, from, so the, from my point of view, there's no point in living if you're not learning. Perhaps that's a bit strong. In fact, I'm sure that's a bit strong, but... Uh, yeah, so I think, I think that there's uh, an idea here coming from Dewey and a philosopher like Aristotle that well, education is really lifelong and you attain a kind of practical wisdom through studying and being educated all the time. So what's the role of philosophy here in this kind of program, in this continuing education program? Well, um, philosophy is one discipline studied at continuing education, uh, not the only discipline, of course. Mm -hmm. um, Plato thought that um, you shouldn't study philosophy at all until you're 50. Um, because until 50, you're too busy, or you should be too busy, according to Plato, um, in engaging in life, in politics, in war. <laughs> I, I hope we don't think that these days, but, but in Plato's time, of course, war was, was something that you had to engage in if you were a youth. Um, and you were gaining your experiences. But when you got to 50, the time had come, um, you no longer had the energy to, to actually engage in life. Um, but what you wanted to do at 50 was reflect on your experiences, mm. to learn from your experiences, to help other people learn from your experiences, to bring it all together. And if you like, make a mental map of, the world as you have experienced it because of course the experience that you have had um is unique it's mm. different from anyone else's experience and therefore if you like it's something of a duty on you on all of us um to reflect on that experience and and to learn from it whatever we can and philosophy is the tool by which to do that Okay, so I like the idea that philosophy, you, you can't study philosophy unless you have gained a lot of experience. As you have said, uh, if you want to be a good, good philosopher, perhaps wait till you're 50. <laughs> well, um, I, I mean, the fact is lots of people start studying philosophy as undergraduates, so when they're 18 or something like that. Right. Um, <coughs> and of course, then the benefit for studying philosophy is that as you acquire experiences, as you go through life, you can fit them into the mental map that you're creating. Um, the fact is actually most 18 year olds think they've experienced enough about the world to, yeah. to be able to start doing what Plato thought you must wait till you're 50 to do. Um, <laughs> we've all had the experience, haven't we, of, of thinking that we know much more than our parents, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so you have done a ton of philosophy podcasts for the continuing education program. So this includes a philosophy for beginners course, a critical thinking course, a course in moral philosophy and others. But what motivated you to do all of these things? Sorry, could you repeat that? So what motivated you to do all the romp through philosophy series? Um, right. Well, funnily enough, it wasn't anything that motivated me in particular, except um, my university was given money by um, an outfit called JISC. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to ask me what JISC means, and I don't know, I'm afraid. But That's all right. <laughs> so, um, anyway, just suffice it to say that, that they give money for doing things like this. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so the money they gave was to record um, and release some podcasts under the title Open Spires. 
Mm -hmm. uh, because we wanted to see, or JISC wanted to see, and Oxford was prepared to, to help with this, um, how many people across the world would be interested in, in lectures from Oxford University. And of course, Oxford wasn't the only university taking part. So I was approached by our IT people mm -hmm. who asked me if I wanted to record or to have recorded um, the lectures that I was going to do that, that term which happened to be a, an introduction to philosophy. Um, so I was asked whether I wanted to make podcasts. Now, I had no idea what a podcast was. <laughs> and I thought, well, it couldn't hurt. Uh, so I said yes. Mm -hmm. And so whilst I lectured, and I just lectured in the way I would always lecture um, when I give standard lectures, um, I was uh, videoed. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, I had to sign a form and they released the video on um, uh, the um, University of iTunes, iTunes U. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and um, the next thing I knew about this was about a year later, when somebody told me that my podcasts had had one uh, hit, no first it was that they had hit number no, one one global number one on the <laughs> university of itunes and i thought ooh, well that's nice <laughs> and, and i i said well how many is that thinking it was a hundred a week or something like that and he said well it's something like eighteen thousand podcasts a day wow <laughs> wow <laughs> yes exactly and very shortly after that it hit a million views and and so on and critical reason i mean from, from that reason of course i couldn't move without being podcast by the university um, mm -hmm. they were making podcasts of almost everything i did and one of the lectures the critical reasoning series hit seven million wow. downloads <laughs> so did you expect such a reaction no, <laughs> I mean, that, that's all I can say. I, it, it was a surprise to me, but um, it, it's, I mean, it's n not surprising that uh, a podcast on, from Oxford was popular on iTunes U. Mm -hmm. It's not surprising that a lecture on philosophy introducing it to beginners was popular on iTunes U, I think. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. The title of the podcast, though I say it myself, was inspired. It was a romp through the history of philosophy. So the word romp, I think, attracted quite a lot of people. Possibly yeah. they didn't think it was philosophy. And they looked it up. <laughs> Actually, it attracted me as well. So I downloaded the all the Ah, okay. Yeah. Well, it, it sounds fun, doesn't it? So, um, yeah. I mean, it became my word. I, I mean, the critical reasoning is a romp through the foothills of logic. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, and your moral philosophy as well. It's a romp through moral philosophy. Through ethics for beginners. Yes. Yep. Okay, so you turn all these things into a book. But how does it feel to be an internet superstar? <laughs> well, I, um, I think I used to be an internet superstar. I, I mean, unfortunately, uh, the Open Spires project came to an end um, mm -hmm. and uh, I haven't made many podcasts since then. Um, people keep asking me if I'd like to make podcasts. Um, and to be honest, I've said no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, I would make them for the department, but the department has been a, a bit in two minds about this. Um, although with the pandemic, I think um, I'm at the moment recording a podcast uh, for the department. Um, so things might change, but who knows? Okay, so you, you have a philosophy of mind series, you have moral philosophy. But what's the future of a continuing education program? And how would philosophy contribute to this work? Um, you mean uh, online or do you mean more generally? More generally, the idea of the continuing education. Something like what you're doing now. Well, philosophy is important to continuing education, not least because the core of philosophy, the methodology of philosophy is logic. Mm -hmm. Um, and without logic, you can't study anything. So um, you need to be able to recognize an argument or to make an argument in an essay or something like that. 
And the best way you can do that is by learning something about critical reasoning, mm -hmm. learning about the different types of arguments, learning how to evaluate arguments, um, learning how to identify and analyze arguments and so on. And all of this, of course, is, is grist to the mill of philosophy. Okay, I noticed that in your podcast, you had students there as well, live students. So you're teaching them. But I, what I hear is that they are adults, real adults. Oh, yes. Well, that's what continuing education is about. I mean, the University of Oxford, most students at the University of Oxford are normal age undergraduates. They're, they're, um, they come up at 17 or 18 and they stay till they're 21-ish. Mm -hmm. um, but the um, Department of Continuing Education used to be required only to deal with students over 23. Now that's, that's changed now because the law has changed. You're not allowed to discriminate according to age. So we have younger students now. Okay. But um, I would say that the average age of students at the Department of Continuing Education um, is 50 or 60. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that, but from my experience, that's that's what I would say. But I've taught people as old as 94. Wow. I've got a 94-year-old at the moment. Okay, so what made them interested in philosophy in your course? Um, well, um, they might not be doing philosophy because I'm also director of the Certificate of Higher Education, oh. um, which is a way of getting into higher education um if you if you've never done it before or it's a way of structuring your learning if you have got a degree and want to continue with learning um philosophy is one of the areas of the certificate of higher education um but in fact the 94 year old is doing philosophy uh and i have to admit it was my podcasts that got him into it so there you are <laughs> <laughs> okay so What's your advice for those starting their academic careers in philosophy? Okay, are you assuming that they're 18 or are you thinking they could be any age? Any age. They want All to get right. into philosophy. They want to be a professional academic philosopher. So what's your advice for them? Oh, oh. can I ask, answer this in two parts? Because That's all right. Um, one is I, uh, advice for people who want to do philosophy at university and the other is people who want to become academic philosophers. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Advice for those who want to do philosophy at university or want to do well in philosophy at university. My key trick is do not try and please your professor. <laughs> um, the, the students who don't do well, for me anyway, are those who try and work out what I believe and feed that back to me. Um, I find that really irritating because it shows to me that they haven't, they're not interested in the issue. Mm -hmm. The only thing they're interested in is what I think of their essay. So it's uh, just parroting what you have is, Yeah, that, that should be very much a secondary consideration. Mm -hmm. So what I want is for them to, to work out what, what the issue is and why it's important, why people have perhaps for centuries argued about this um, and look at both sides of the argument and be able to put um, at least two arguments from each of the sides. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's my tip for people who want to do philosophy well at university. Um, for those who want to become academic philosophers, I'm very tempted to say don't. <laughs> like Wittgenstein, apparently. Oh, is that what he said? Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's his advice to his students, right? I don't always agree with Wittgenstein, but in this yeah. case, if that's what he said, I do. It, it's a very tough life. I, I've got um, 24 student, uh, tutors under me at OUDC who are all... Um, people who have portfolio careers in philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, they, they're making up, a, um, making a living by having work in from here, there and everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I can only give them um, sort of two or three 
lecture series a year, which doesn't pay for a mortgage, um, in order to, to get a job that will pay for a mortgage and a family and so on, you need a full-time permanent job. Mm -hmm. um, and those are very hard to come by in philosophy. I mean, if you study maths at university, you can get jobs in accountancy or all sorts of other things. It's true that if you study philosophy at university, you can go on to be a lawyer or a computer programmer or all sorts of things which, which will provide you a perfectly good career. But a career in philosophy is, is quite difficult to come by. Um, so I'm, I'm afraid that is my advice. Um, <laughs> don't go into philosophy. <laughs> don't go into, uh, become an academic philosopher. But if you insist on becoming an academic philosopher, um, mm. then my advice is publish as much as you can. Forget teaching, forget all the other things, forget being a good citizen, you know, <laughs> doing Christmas parties for your department and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. The only thing that matters is publication mm -hmm. and publish as much as you can. Um, and, and I hate giving that advice. The reason I hate giving that advice is it's relatively easy to get things published. It's very difficult to publish good things. That's true. Um, and I think you should be doing only the latter. Mm -hmm. But quite honestly, if you want a job in philosophy, the former is the way to go. Yeah. Well, both. <laughs> I mean, publish as many good things as you can, but um, you have to pay the mortgage. If you're not so good, do so. <laughs> okay, for you, is the career of an academic philosopher worth it? Is the career of an academic philosopher worth it? For you. Um, I wouldn't have it any differently, but then I started a long time ago. I, I'm actually retiring next year, oh. um, so I'm right at the end of my career. And in some ways I've been lucky in that I got in in the in the golden days as it were mm -hmm. um, and I've had a very satisfying and very good career um, but but not everyone is going to be that lucky and and it gets harder as I mean really as we widen participation um, and it means that, that people from every part of the world are, have access to higher education. Mm -hmm. uh, philosophy, like every other discipline, is being democratized, which is a really good thing. Um, but that, of course, means that you've got a very much larger pool from which the good philosophers are taken. Right. Um, and therefore, the pool of good philosophers is also larger. Um, and a lot depends on, on luck. Right. And pushiness. <laughs> publishing. Okay, so we'll entertain some questions from our live audience. So if you have questions, just put them on the chat box. For those on YouTube, there's someone there uh, waiting for your questions as well, including for the Facebook. So, okay, so here's a question from this Zoom chat. What's your best-selling program in continuing education in Oxford? And what are the trending courses in your program? In philosophy? No, um, in, the, in the whole continuing education program, I think. Oh, mm. I'm, I'm not sure I can answer that. Uh, well, yes, I can. Uh, well, I have a, a rather skewed view because, of course, I'm the director of studies in philosophy. But creative writing is, is a hugely popular course. Mm -hmm. in philosophy but but also um history academic history um i mean the eight subjects that make up the subjects of the certificate of higher education are probably the the most popular that's um philosophy history art history english um political economics Ooh. and two others i can't remember so no, this three are others i can't remember I think these are liberal arts courses. Um, yes, they are. The the um, I I mean, as I said, with continuing education, we don't have laboratories, mm -hmm. so we tend not to have um, such a high uh, interest in science. So, how about in your philosophy program? What are the course popular courses there? Um, critical reasoning and ethics are are two um, well. 
Actually, they're all popular. Critical reasoning, ethics, mind. Um, probably the most popular is the introduction to philosophy, because of course, what I said earlier about it's not being a school subject um, mm. is actually quite important. Um, a lot of people don't know what philosophy is, and therefore they're interested to try philosophy um, just to see what it's like. Um, and often that's without any intention whatsoever of, of continuing in philosophy. But the lovely thing about philosophy is it tends to ambush you. People <laughs> who, who like philosophy absolutely love philosophy and they get hooked. And uh, the next thing you know, they're, they're wanting to do a doctorate and do things like become an academic philosopher. <laughs> Okay, so do philosophy teachers teach these courses, the philosophy program courses? Oh, yes. Oh, oh. yes, of course. I, I mean, we couldn't have tutors uh, at the University of Oxford who, who didn't have at least two degrees in the subject that they teach. Okay, so uh, there's another question here. Is there a way to access your books? Free? Um, a free access, I think. Free? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you have to pay for it, sorry. <laughs> um, well, I mean, there is a way, if you like, of accessing them free, but, but, and that's by my podcasts. Right. I, I mean, the, for example, the Critical Reasoning book, uh, which has been hugely popular, um, is actually a book written on the basis of the podcasts. It didn't happen the other way around. So first came the podcast, then came the book. Mm -hmm. um, and I've written the book as a, as a it's an e-book. I'm publishing it myself or, or with somebody called Chris Wood, who's, who's written lots of widgets and things which I know nothing about. Uh -huh. um, it's, it's published as an e-book, so it's actually very cheap. I think it's only, actually I've no idea how much it is, but it's under 10 pounds online. That's almost free, okay. isn't it? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so uh, here's another question. Is a continuing education program visible here in a third world country like the Philippines? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if, if you um, access the ComTED website, my goodness me, you're going to ask what that is now, aren't you? <laughs> um, I think if you put Oxford, uh, Oxford University into the website, and then when you get to the Oxford site, look for continuing education, um, you'll get all our courses. And I mean, at the moment, of course, because of the pandemic, um, you can access just about every course we're doing because all our courses are online at the moment. Unfortunately, um, most of them are not free, of course. Mm -hmm. So, so that's the downside for anyone in a in and you called it a third world country. I, I don't think of the Philippines as a third world country myself, but maybe that's. Um, <laughs> but um, if money is a problem, there are um, bursaries and things, but I have no idea how hard or how easy it is to get them. But certainly if you have the money, access is easy. Mm -hmm. And especially at the moment, um, because of the pandemic. Okay. So here's another question. What is this certificate program in continuing education all about? What, uh, is, what is a possible job that you could take after this? Um, well, the Certificate for Higher Education, I've been mentioning several times because I'm the director of it. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't prepare you for a job um, so much as prepare you for university. Okay. Um, okay. So if you haven't been to university, the Cert HE is a, is a course that you do part time for either two years or four years, probably whilst you're working. Um, and it prepares you. By the time you finish the course, you will be well and truly prepared for higher education. In fact, the qualification you get is equivalent to the first year of university. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, here's the other question. What is the status of women population in philosophy in your university? Much better than it used to be. Um, when I first arrived, there were very few women. And in fact, one of the um, tutors at the Faculty of Philosophy um, used to refer to all the students as gentlemen. <laughs> and he would write notes to gentlemen. Uh, and he wouldn't recognize the, the women in the class at all. I had a colleague, in fact, when I was first taken on at Pembroke College in Oxford, Mm -hmm. uh, who wouldn't talk to me at all, wouldn't even meet my gaze. <laughs> and I remember entering a, co a corridor at one time when he entered uh, by the door at the other end of the corridor. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is going to be interesting. So I, I maintained eye contact with his face, not his eyes, <laughs> all the way up the corridor. And he just wouldn't look at me at all. Mm -hmm. um, so... I, it's changed massively over the 40 years that I've been in Oxford. Um, there are many, many more women now, uh, and women have very serious jobs. I mean, the, the Wiccan professor of logic at the moment is, is a woman. Oh, who, who, is um, the, who, who is this? Um, I knew you were going to ask me that, and I can't <laughs> think of her name at the moment. Um, but if you look up look at Wiccan professor of logic, um, mm. you will find that it's a woman. Yeah, it's Michael Domit's old chair, right? That's that's right. Yes, yes. <laughs> Actually, you're just sort of making me wonder whether it's not the Wiccan professor of metaphysics who's female. I should have checked these things out. I didn't think you'd ask me things like this. But, uh, <laughs> one of them, well, the, the two most important chairs in the university mm. in British philosophy, possibly in the world, uh, of the two, one of them is held by a woman. And so that, that, 40 years ago, that would never have happened. Okay, so here's another question. What are the most enrolled unique philosophy courses at Oxford? What does this person mean, most unique? Unique philosophy, or perhaps the not standard philosophy courses? Oh, I see. Um, well, when you say it's Oxford, um, I can only speak for the Department of Continuing Education. Um, online, we don't really have any non-standard courses because um, obviously we want to appeal to as many people as, pos as possible. So we tend to have um, the courses that everybody is looking for. Um, but um, in my weekly classes, in my um, day schools and weekend schools and summer schools, um, I can do things like philosophy and film studies. Mm -hmm. uh, philosophy and horror was okay. the subject of a, of a recent weekly class. Mm -hmm. um, we can have things from Plato to NATO. Um, I mean, there, there are some very interesting ones, but they tend to be the face-to-face -face courses, um, mm -hmm. not the stuff that we have online. So I'm afraid that if you're in the Philippines, you're unlikely to get the unique or non-standard philosophy courses on offer, I'm afraid, at least from us at the yeah. moment. Okay, so who designs these courses? Philosophy of horror, philosophy of theater, film? Um, <laughs> the tutors. Uh, I, I have a panel of part-time tutors. There are 24 of them. And every year I, I write to them and I say, what which course would you like to do? for not this year but next year mm -hmm. um, and they come up with something they might be writing a book on it or they might be have just become interested in it for, for example I became very interested in the um, link between philosophy and humor once mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I toyed with writing a book and had I been one of my part-time tutors I might have offered me a course on philosophy and of humor. Okay, <laughs> so you have interesting subjects. You could have philosophy of humor, philosophy of love, perhaps. Oh yes, I've done a course on philosophy of love. Goodness, that was a long time ago. Yeah, so the tutors and you designed these things one year beforehand? Uh, uh, 18 months beforehand. They offer me the course and I say, well, that sounds interesting. Tell me a bit more. 
Um, and if um, I like the sound of it, they write a full course proposal mm -hmm. um, so that they tell me what the objectives are, what, how they're going to achieve those objectives, what books they're going to use, what, what videos they're going to use. Um, and I will approve that course proposal if I think it, it enhances our complete program. Mm -hmm. And how do you offer that to the students? So you post an advertisement or what's the... And, and then, well, if you, um, if you go onto our website, you'll see that there is um, something that will enable you to sign up to our uh, mailing list. Mm, okay, um, okay. So uh, if you sign up to the mailing list, you get information about all our courses. You don't get... You know, sort of 20 a week you'll get one link to our website when the program's released mm -hmm. so how many students do you have on average per class oh um per class it can be as well, i mean we have limits on the class sizes but, um because I mean, if it's online, there's a limit to the number of students that a teacher can deal with in an, an online class. Mm -hmm. uh, the limit there is 32. Um, if it's a face-to-face -face class, the limit tends to be 25. Um, but actually, most classes will be fewer than that, about, about 20. Um, if it's a weekend school, of course, um, it can fill the lecture theatre at 115. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, if it's an online course, although 32 is the limit, um, if we get enough students, we can run two courses at the same time. Yeah, so it, yeah because you're using the MOOC, right? M-O-O-C? We don't use MOOCs. Um, we, we, use, um, we have our own online provision. Um, we use Moodle as the virtual ah. learning environment. Okay, so... At a time like this, the pandemic, how useful is online education? Oh, well, I, I mean, I think Oxford is luckily a very rich university. We wouldn't have collapsed without it. Um, but the online provision has allowed us to, to um, not lose the amount of money that we would otherwise have lost. We, we had to cancel the whole of the summer school. That's that's. <laughs> hundreds of, of students were, were sent away. We had to cancel the whole program of weekly classes. Mm -hmm. um, so if it hadn't been for the online courses, we would have had no provision at all. But we doubled our online provision and we've created um, WOW, which is weekly Oxford. <laughs> no, hang on. Worldwide Oxford Weekly, Weekly Oxford Worldwide, or something. Anyway, okay. it's wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so how and, and without online, we, we, we really uh, wouldn't have had anything to offer. Yeah, I think that's a problem all around the world as well. Well, I mean, Oxford was lucky because we, we weren't playing catch up. We've had a, a thriving online program for about 20 years now. So, um, we were very lucky to be able to make use of the existing online provision. We weren't scrambling to yeah. produce yeah. online courses. Okay, so here's another question. How many articles have you done? Journal articles, I think. Not many. Not many, because I'm afraid my career has tended towards the administration end of philosophy rather than the publishing end. But... That isn't to say I might not have preferred the publishing end. Had I obeyed my own advice and got <laughs> loads of publications, which is what I should have done. Um, so I, I've had a satisfying career despite not having published a lot. So I've published um, possibly more books than articles, but maybe not. Okay, so what's your most penetrating or sorry can you give us the title of the most interesting or most viewed uh, iTunes lecture you have critical reasoning critical reasoning so critical reasoning colon a romp through the foothills of logic mm -hmm. um, it's yep. a bit by far and away the most popular 
And I suspect that's because um, in many countries like the US, for example, critical reasoning is a very important skill because it gets you into the graduate recruitment program mm -hmm. of many universities. So I, I and also, I, I mean, reasoning is what human beings do. And so lots of people are interested in how to do it better. Okay, so your critical reasoning course is your bestseller, your top. <laughs> and, and ditto. Well, of, of, um, critical reasoning is probably my best-selling book, um, if not for bioethics. I have a book on bioethics mm -hmm. published by Cambridge University Press, which is also sells very, very well. Okay, uh, are there more questions? Okay, so here's another question. Do you have new works coming, forthcoming works? Um, I'm currently working on a lecture. Um, I don't know if you'd call that a work, but, but I, I've just finished it this morning, I think, um, mm -hmm. on iconoclasm. Um, so talking about the Black Lives Matter and, and things like that. So that's going to be, I'm going to lecture on that on the 5th of October. Um, I, I would like to write another book during retirement, um, but I won't start that until I retire, which is um, one year and two days away. <laughs> so, um, so it won't be out for at least three years, I wouldn't have thought. Okay. Uh, I think, oh, wait, we still have questions. <laughs> Happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Thank it's you. Your, it's your birthday. Yes, on the no, not today. On the seventeenth of September, three okay. days away. Okay, advance happy birthday. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. Okay, I think that's enough for now. So thanks again, Professor Talbot, for sharing your time with us. That's and my pleasure. Thank you for your questions. Okay, so you've been helpful in in my Ethicomics program as well. My Ethicomics. Uh, Good. Work. Yep, and you have promoted it in Twitter, and a lot of people are downloading that as well. Thanks very much. Good. Good. <laughs> well, well done for doing it. Okay, so join me again for another episode of Philosophy at What Matters, where we talk about things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Cheers. Okay, bye. Okay, so I'll just stop recording.